Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to let you know we're going to give people a few more minutes to get here because of the weather. So we'll be getting started in about five to ten minutes. Thanks.
test, test. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Steve Crory, your 2018 uh, ABOR president of the board. I'd like to welcome you guys to yet another informative forum, this one on Austin's changing fl floodplains. And we paid a lot of money for our special effects this morning out for Mother Earth. So hopefully you got the driving experience and realized how important this is for the city and our members. So um, we have some guests from the city's watershed protection department uh, who that department manages our creeks and our drainage and our water quality uh, for the city uh, with us today is going to be kevin shunk and he is the city's floodplain administrator and matt holland and he is the division manager for the planning and watershed department so they're going to give us a little presentation uh, then we're interested in having a little q a session but if you could hold all your questions until the end. We will have uh, two roaming mic gophers running around. Um, it's important that we all remember that we are live streaming this, Facebook and on the website. So if you have a question, wait until one of those microphones makes it away ar around to you so that our members at home can hear your question. So without further ado, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. All right, can everybody hear me okay? The rain is perfect. It fits in with our conversation perfectly. So thank you for the special effects. And thank you also for pulling out your jackets this morning. Is this awesome or what? I think it feels great out there. Um, I am the flood plan administrator for the city of Austin, and I'm also the division manager of the division of staff who does many things. We design, implement, and construct flood risk reduction projects like low water crossings, uh, storm drain systems, detention ponds, tunnels. Um, we also review development to uh, make sure it's, uh, it satisfies the floodplain regulations, which I'm sure you've probably dealt with before. And we also have the flood warning group. So anytime there's water falling from the sky, our group is probably dealing with it. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today is a new study that tells us that it is more likely for this area to be getting severe thunderstorms than we previously thought. So we're gonna talk about this Atlas 14 study. What does that mean? What is the study itself? We're gonna talk about the rainfall data that comes out of Atlas 14. Talk about how that rainfall data is going to affect floodplains in the city of Boston. Some recommendations for some floodplain code amendments that we have in place right now in response to Atlas 14. And then what are the next steps after today? We have some more steps we have to go through. We'll talk about those steps uh, at the end. And then we'll have time for as much Q&A as you guys have. I don't have anything else going on today. I can stay as long as you want. All right, what is Atlas 14? It is a nationwide study of rainfall, historic rainfall rates being done by the National Weather Service. This is not a city of Boston study. We were partners in it, along with many other federal, local, and state partners, but we did not do the study ourselves. It is being done by the National Weather Service for the entire country. Texas is one of the last areas in the country to have this study done. 
The Northwest states are going to be after us. They're going to be last. But the rest of the country has already had this study done. There are some areas that have seen increases in rainfall rates, predicted rainfall rates, such as we have. There are other parts of the, of the, of the nation that have not seen increases similar to what uh, Texas has shown. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like here. If it, I mean, it's, there we go. Sorry. Whoops, too far now. All right, there's Texas. So this is a comparison of the previous federal rainfall study to the current federal rainfall study. When was the last federal one done? 1961. It was a, a study called Technical Paper 40. And for all your engineering friends, if you just say TP40, they probably know what you're talking about. 1961 was the last federal study. Now, locally, within the city of Austin, we had a study that was done in 1998. So we have some more updated studies in Austin, but this map right here shows the comparison between Atlas 14 and TP40. And where you see green, that means Atlas 14 is predicting higher rainfall rates for a 100-year storm. Where you see gray, that means there's no change from the 61 study to Atlas 14. And in that small section in West Texas there where you see some brown, there's a slight reduction in rainfall rates predicted. Again, that's 100-year, 24-hour rainfall rates. Where you see green, again, increases. Where you see different colors of green, the darker the green, the higher the increase in 100-year rainfall rates. So you can't see from there probably, but there is a number three contour around Austin. What does that three mean? That means that Alice 14 is predicting the 100-year rainfall rate is three inches higher than TB40. The city of Houston sees, has a five contour around it. Their 100-year rainfall rate is five inches higher than it was with TB40. Significant differences. Back to the full picture of the state there, that red outline there is the Colorado River watershed basin. The entire, it just stretches up, up into ne uh, New Mexico. And the reason I put that on there is to indicate that upstream of Austin, we're not expecting a lot of changes in rainfall rates that are going to impact the Colorado River. That's going to come into play here as we go through. So think back to that, dot that picture right there when we get to that point. All right, so what are these rainfall rates that we're predicting? As of now, today, today the 100-year rainfall rate in the city of Boston is about 10 inches of rain in 24 hours. All right, we're not getting a 100-year storm right now. I can guarantee you that. But 10 inches in 24 hours, that's a lot of water. Alice 14 is predicting that number is going to go up to 13 plus inches for parts of Austin. Again, three inch, about a three inch increase. That number, 13 plus inches, is currently close to what we think of as a 500 year rainfall storm. So the 500 year storm now is 13 and a half inches. What we're predicting the 100 year storm to be is about 13 plus inches. They're very similar. Likewise, what we think of now as a 100-year storm, 10 inches again. And what we think of as a 25-year storm in the future is going to be close to what we think of as a 100-year storm now. So but this is going to come back in, into play also. You don't have to memorize the table, though, because I'll bring it back before I can talk about it. So I wanted to touch on uh, why flooding occurs a little bit. We categorize flooding into two, into two different buckets. We have creek flooding and we have local flooding. All right, creek flooding is when, creek, when, water, when it rains, water gets to a creek, and the water cannot stay within that channel anymore. And it overtops its banks, and it starts to flow in the floodplain, in the streets, in people's lots. But the water comes from the creek. That's, this is a picture of creek flooding right here. Walnut Creek sits in back of this lot, and the Walnut Creek got so high, it came up into the lots, came up into the street as well. There's another picture of the same house, creek flooding. Now you can see, when we go back there, the storm drain in, right there in front of the house has very little water going in it. That tells us that's not a local flooding problem we're having. This is a creek flooding problem. Inlets that have local flooding problems look like this one. When water tries to get to the, into the inlet, into the storm drain pipe, but it can't because too much water can't get into the pipe. So that's called local flooding. So water that's trying to get into the storm drain system, trying to get to the creek, can't get to the creek for a variety of reasons, it's going to cause local flooding. That local flooding can flood streets, it can flood properties, it can flood houses, and it happens very, very fast. This is a picture in Hyde Park 
on Avenue A, water's flowing down the street at about 10 feet per second. A lot of water going very, very fast. So what do we, what do we mean when we say 100-year flood? What does that really mean? Does that mean we've already had one, so if we have one one year, we're not going to have one for another 100 years? It doesn't mean that at all. It's a statistical uh, number. It means there's a 1% chance that we're going to have a 100-year flood in any given year. That means we can have more than one in a year. We can have more than one in a week. Just because you have a 100-year flood does not mean it's going to be another, another 99 years before we have the next one. And the one thing that I think really hits home with people, when they hear, sometimes when people hear 1% chance, they think, oh, that's not much. I'm not going to worry about that. This is a number that uh, FEMA really talks about a lot, and they encourage communities to talk about it because I think it hits home. And with you guys talking about people with mortgages, I think it hits home even, even more so. Over the life of a 30-year mortgage, if you have a home in the 100-year floodplain, there's a 26% chance that home is going to get flooded. That number strikes home. That makes a little more sense and makes people hopefully think twice about, well, maybe I need to think about what I need to do. Do I need to buy the house? Do I need to sell the house? Do I need flood insurance? What is my next step now that I realize that my flood risk is as high as it actually is? The 100-year storm or the 100-year flood is the standard flood for flood insurance purposes across the entire nation and usually for flood uh, regu regulatory purposes as well. So not just the city of Austin, but thousands of other communities throughout the nation use this 100-year flood to regulate development within their community. So what does it mean that the rainfall rate is increasing? That means that our floodplains are going to get bigger. And when floodplains get bigger, that means there are going to be, there's going to be more homes and more buildings within the 100-year within the floodplain. And the buildings that are already in the floodplain are going to have expected deeper water in the floodplain. The flood, the, we're going to have more low water crossings in the floodplain, and low water crossings that are currently in the floodplain, like Spicewood Springs, close to where we are, um, is going to be deeper and faster velocities expected. So flood risk is going to increase. All right, currently there's about 4,000 buildings in the 100-year floodplain. It's about 9% of the land area in the entire city of Austin. Now, remember that slide when we, we looked at the rainfall rates and we saw that the future 100-year was close to the current 500-year, okay? So what that does for us is that means that, I'm going to move away from the mic, um, that means that we have well, we already have 500-year floodplain maps and floodplain models, and so that gives us data information to use as a comparison prior to us doing this uh, new floodplain study. So when I say in the current 500-year floodplain, that's another way of saying in the future 100-year floodplain. Okay, so in the 500-year floodplain, there's about 7,000 buildings that are gonna be in the floodplain. That's an increase of 3,000 buildings going to be brought into the 100-year floodplain and into the regulatory floodplain. All right, so here's a couple pictures that I showed here of floodplains changing, all right? The first case is a significant change, and the second case, not so much. Um, I'll get to the point of why we look at these and what is your homework assignment after, after we look at these, these two right here. This is a uh, subdivision called uh, Los Yellows on the southeast side of town. That blue color we're seeing right there is the current 100-year floodplain. So if we turn on the 500-year floodplain, we see that it's going to greatly impact that subdivision and that's gonna pull in more lots in, that are in the floodplain. Again, this is Waller Creek in Hyde Park. Blue is 100-year floodplain turn on the 500 year, it's just around the edges. So it's not as much of an impact in this area. And that we've seen that, we can see that across the city. There are some areas where there's going to be a significant impact, and there are other areas where it's not so significant. So how am I, how are you supposed to know what the impact is? This is your homework assignment. 
And I already know that you guys know about Flood Pro because I've talked to lots of you about it. Um, we have an online floodplain information tool called Flood Pro, and there was a handout. I have my handout. There, there, there was a handout on an, basically an instruction sheet on how to use Flood Pro. That's what this slide is, is meant to do. So please take the handout and identify your home, your place of worship, your office, and maybe most importantly with this group is your client's proposed home or existing home to understand what the flood risk is at their building. So, atxfloodpro.com, click on the top left there where it says, I want to, and then click on the button that says, Explore Atlas 14 Changes. Enter your address, click on the search button, and it's going to zoom right to your property that you entered. Again, the blue is current 100-year floodplain, and the pink is, per, is the current 500-year floodplain, or the proposed, close to be the proposed 100-year floodplain. You can look at any, any parcel of land in the entire city of Boston. You don't have to search. You can pan around, play with it, have fun with it. You can print floodplain maps from FloodPro. You can identify flood risk for, for FloodPro. You can see if there's an elevation certificate for a building on, on FloodPro. There's lots of information there. So please use that as a resource as you go about doing business within the city of Boston. All right, so what are some of our flood risk reduction strategies? Um, there are many things that we do to flood risk that currently exist today because areas were built prior to our floodplain regulations. Our regulations were, it came into, pl in, in, into the code in 1983. And as we all know, our town was here way before 1983. So there were lots of areas that had flood risk, that have flood risk now, that need some project to, project to reduce that flood risk. And that's what we do is we build capital projects for flood risk reduction. What are some of those projects? We upgrade low water crossings to make them look like that, where they're safer to cross. We build detention ponds or retention ponds all throughout town. Yes, commercial developments do that, do that also, but we build some that are city ponds, larger ponds, we call them regional ponds, to capture more water and reduce the risk of flooding more so than maybe a small on-site pond can. We do buyouts of projects. And so and this is uh, Cherry Creek um, down in Williamson Creek where we did some buyouts. Um, we had some homes that were flooded. We had some rescuers uh, happen there. We have done more than 1,000 buyouts since the uh, Halloween 2013 flood. That is the single most effective way of reducing flood risk is to remove the home. The next word I'm going to talk about in a minute is called freeboard. But to remove the home, you're removing a flood risk entirely. If you have a 100-year storm or a 500-year storm or 1,000-year storm, that home will not be flooded because it's not there anymore. And as I'm sure you're aware of, we build tunnels as well. We, are building, we're, we're, we're build, we have built an, a big one down in Wall Creek um, that is uh, just wrapped up not too long ago. And the last thing we do is we build what, uh, flood walls uh, or barriers. Uh, we don't have a lot of le levees here in Austin, but we have two areas that have flood walls, and uh, that reduces the risk of flooding for neighbors behind the flood wall. All right, so that's for flood risks that already exist. But how do we prevent those flood risks from happening or being created uh, as the city gets to be developed? And we do that with our floodplain rules and our floodplain regulations. And we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit about new regulations that we have that we're, that we're proposing um, in light of what we learned from our learning with Alice 14. All right, so I like to break the amendments up into two different categories. One is floodplain definitions, and the other one is floodplain management regulation changes. All right, two different groups. The objectives of these things is to ensure that Lights are being turned off. Watch out. Uh, <laughs> is to make sure uh, that we're limiting construction activities that increase flood risk. And we're, the other intent is to make sure that for residential redevelopment 
we're simplifying the rules to re redevelop residential land. And I'm going to talk in detail about that, about that because I know that's, that's uh, near and dear to your heart is, uh, is, re is uh, residential development. All right, let's go back to that rainfall table that we showed earlier. So when we think about floodplain definitions, if we change the definition of, a flood, of the 100-year floodplain in the Land Development Code, then we're changing what's called the regulatory floodplain. There are many places within the, within the code that refer back to that definition, and changing that definition is going to change the regulatory floodplain. Now remember, the 500-year floodplain is similar to the proposed 100-year floodplain. So that's what we propose in the interim to change the 100-year floodplain to be the 500-year floodplain. And when I say interim, what, I'm, what do I mean by that? Over the next couple of years, we're going to restudy all the floodplains in the entire city of Austin with this new Atlas 14 data. That's going to create new 100-year floodplains for us. During that time, we're going to use, we propose to use, the current 500-year floodplain as a proxy for that new 100-year because it's going to take us two years to get those new floodplains. And we don't want to be allowing development that in, within what is going to be that 100-year floodplain. So our proposal is to use that 500-year floodplain until the floodplain studies are done. That's what I mean by interim. And the 25-year floodplain um, redefinition will be the current 100-year floodplain. Again, back to the definition of the rainfall rates, the current 100-year floodplain is going to be what the, new, what the proposed 25-year floodplain looks like. All right, so there's basically three floodplain management changes that we're proposing. One is called the redevelopment exception. One is the Colorado River exception, an expansion of an existing ex exception. We'll talk about that. And the third one is freeboard, and I'll define what that is so we're all on the same page. All right, redevelopment exception basically says that you can encroach on the 25-year or the 100-year floodplain with a building as long as it's replacing an existing building. The finished floor of the, of the building is two feet above the 100-year floodplain, the new 100-year floodplain. Right? It has freeboard, factor of safety. We'll get more into that. It does not increase the number of dwelling units, so that means that under this exception, you couldn't, you couldn't go from a single family house to a duplex uh, or a duplex to a triplex, but you could go from a duplex to a duplex. So you can't increase the number of dwelling units with, ex with, ex with this exception as we're proposing it now. And of course, uh, one of the tenets of our flood plan man pro management program is ensuring that whatever the development is, it's not causing additional flooding on other properties. You meet all, the, all those conditions, and with this proposed rule, we would be able to administratively waive what we call the safe access requirement. And that requirement says you have to be able to walk from your building to the right-of-way, all at an elevation that's one foot above the, fl the floodplain. So if the entire lot and the street is in the 100-year floodplain, it's impossible to meet safe access. And the only remedy for that now is to get a, a, a city council granted floodplain variance. Time consuming, expensive. So what this proposal would be to do is to create an administrative process where staff, as long as it meets those conditions, can approve that, uh, that development administratively. So what does that mean about uh, additions and renovations? As long as the home meets freeboard, then it, it would satisfy, it would, that develop that additional renovation would would uh, would be covered under this exception. We're getting to free board in a sec. Don't worry. Um, the, we currently have an exception in the code that says a building can encroach in the hundred-year floodplain of the Colorado River, downstream of Longhorn Dam, and on Lady Bird Lake. What we propose to do is to expand that exception to include Lake Austin and include our portion of Lake Travis. So in other words, treat the entire Colorado River, Colorado River the same, not just those two lower areas. So again, 
Hundred year encroachment is allowed with this, this this exception, so long as it's within those areas. It's it's it still does not allow twenty five year encroachment of a building. So if you're encroaching on that twenty five year, the current exception does not allow it, and we're proposing to keep that. This is just one hundred year encroachment of a building. All right, free board. Free board is basically a way of saying factor of safety. All right, a building that has free board is built above the 100 year flood plain. And what that, how high it's built above it depends on the rule, right? The current rule in the city of Boston is one foot of freeboard. So the minimum distance above the 100, 100 year flood plain that a building can be built is one foot. Unless you're in the central business area, then it's two feet. Unless you're getting an administrative flood plain variant, then it's two feet. It, that's all confusing. Let's just make it two feet across the board. That, that, that makes it simpler. That reduces risk significantly. And so that's our proposal is to change the free board requirement up so it's two feet for everybody across the board in the entire city. There's an example of a home that has free board. Um, you can see that the garage itself is in the flood, is lower, and that means it's in the floodplain. That's okay to have parking and storage in the floodplain. You have to step up to the house, give it that free board such that the finished floor is elevated above the 100-year floodplain. And again, except for buyouts, for having free board is the single most effective way to reduce flood risk to a building. The higher, the better, we always tell people. And that not only reduces flood risk, but it will reduce flood insurance premiums down the road significantly. The higher, the better. All right, let's talk a little bit about flood insurance. Um, flood insurance is a program run by FEMA. The only aspect of it that the city of Boston has with the flood insurance program is providing flood risk information back to FEMA. So we do floodplain studies here and we give that technical engineering data to FEMA. They update their flood insurance rate map. They administer the program. All we do is provide the engineering data for them. So. What happens when 3,000 more buildings are put into the floodplain? That means that there will be possibly, probably, a, those buildings might require flood insurance. Now, when is flood insurance required? Um, if you have a federally backed loan and you're in the 100 year floodplain, then flood insurance is required. And I'm sure, as you all know, lender, lenders can require flood insurance in, at any time. So, whether it's a federally backed loan, whether the 100 year floodplain is two feet away from the building, it's up to the lender to decide when flood insurance is, going, is required. What we tell people about flood insurance is, first of all, we tell them we don't run the flood insurance program, um, but most important thing is to tell them, talk to your insurance agent now. Because your insurance agent is gonna know the flood insurance program and they're gonna know that Maybe the best thing for this policy is that you buy the policy prior to the floodplain maps changing. That's called being grandfathered. That will save some money down the road for your clients. So talk to your insurance agent, recommend that your, your, your clients talk to their insurance agents to understand what it means to be grandfathered and if that policy for that property can be grandfathered. Very important conversation to have. All right, what are our next steps? So we just received the final data from Atlas 14 about three weeks ago. Uh, we saw some draft data in January and then the final data three weeks ago, and it did not change much at all. Um, so now that we have that data, staff has to look at that information and decide how it's going to affect the drainage rules, storm drain design, detention pond design, not just floodplain. And all that information is in the drainage criteria manual or DCM. So it's gonna take us some time to kind of go through that information and understand what portions of the DCM need to be revised. In February is our current timeline. February is when we propose to take the first reading of this new floodplain ordinance to city council for their consideration. Leading up to that date, we have many boards and commissions where we will be doing public hearings to discuss the proposed changes. So there's lots of opportunities for, lot more opportunities for public input. 
we have done probably 30 plus presentations to public, to professional organizations, to neighborhood associations about Alice Fortney. So we're trying to get the word out so that people know what's coming. And we have this entire public hearing process to go through the uh, Environmental Commission, Zoning and Planning Commission, Planning Commission, uh, Building and Fire Code Board of Appeals, Codes and Ordinances Committee, and then City Council. So that's a, it's a long list that we still have left to do to get those public hearings through the system to get to City Council for their consideration of this ordinance. Again, in 2019, after staff has some time to digest the data, we will come forward with some DCM revisions, um, going through the rules change process. That's gonna happen in 2019. And then um, over the course, like I said, over the course of the next two years, we're gonna restudy floodplains in the entire city of Boston. That's a huge process and it's a, it, it's a very short time frame to do it, but that is our goal, to get it done in two years. And that's going to, that's going to tell us what the new 100 year floodplain is. So after that's done, we'll come back to do another code, or, uh, code change to remove the 500 year floodplain from the definition because at that time we'll have new 100 year floodplains. So we're gonna stick with the 100 year floodplain being the regulatory floodplain, it's just gonna be defined with the Alice 14 data as opposed to the old data it's defined by now. After we're done with those engineering studies, like I said, we present that information to FEMA and then they will update their flood insurance rate map. That's, those are the maps that lenders use to uh, determine flood insurance requirements. All right, I'm gonna leave with this slide up, um, but one thing that I wanted to say is that over the past, I guess, I don't know, maybe two months or so, maybe it was a month or so, we met with Amy and Andre. And one of the things that came out of that meeting, and that's why we're here today, is we want to partner with you guys more. We want to do more with your group. Events like this, but reaching you guys is one of the best ways to reach the people who are buying the houses. And 80% of the 7,000 buildings in the, in the 500 flood, 80% are residential buildings. So we wanted to do more to reach out to you guys, to work with you guys, and provide information to you such that you can then disseminate that information to your clients. So this has our website, uh, Alice 14, um, uh, has some contact information as far as an email address and our floodplain hotline and then uh, your homework assignment there, atxfloodpro.com, you have your handout, and we went through a very, very brief tutorial about what that means and what you can get from it. Um, so we'll open it up to questions because one, another thing we found over these past 30 presentations we've done is that the presentation, ah, who cares about that? It's the Q&A that is the most important because it's exactly what you wanna hear is the question you ask, and it's a great way for us to have a conversation about what it is that we're proposing and why we're, we're proposing it. So let's open it up to Q&A. Yes, sir. Oh, Oops, sorry. Mr. The 4,000 number that you're using in the 7,200, is that lots or buildings known on those lots to actually exist below the floodplain? That's buildings, not lots, just buildings, but it's not necessarily buildings that are below the floodplain. That's buildings that are touched by the floodplain. So that a building could be 10 feet above the floodplain, but with the information we have, we don't know that yet. So that's buildings touched by the 100 year floodplain. Okay, and, the, and so that number may be even potentially higher from a, if you look at the 7,200, and let's just say hypothetically, 60% are not only touched, but actually below the elevation. That's not even necessarily accounting for the new two-foot freeboard. Because you're not only raising the floodplain, you're raising the requirements of where those buildings need to exist. For new buildings, that's right. We're not gonna retroactively make it a requirement that all buildings be two feet above existing buildings. We have thousands of existing, what we call existing non-conforming structures, buildings in the floodplain. 
in the free board requirement is not going to affect any of those buildings. So the free board requirement is just for new buildings or redeveloped buildings um, that are going to be built within the floodplain, not for existing buildings. Talk a little bit about the specific facility. I do understand that the Hotel Two Peaks is a separate facility. Yeah, so Matt Holland has a good point. Um, talking about if you're building, if you're if you're proposing a building that is not in the floodplain but it is next to the floodplain, it still has that free board requirement because there's still flood risk to that building because you have floodplain right next to you. So the free board requirement is not just for building in the floodplain, it's buildings adjacent to the floodplain as well. Other questions? Go ahead. This is a simple question. I was just wondering um, where we could get information about uh, flood zones and areas outside of Travis County. Does that ATX flood throw only count for buildings within Austin or is it the whole Austin Metro? Okay, that's a great question. Um, another great thing about this uh, uh, session is I don't have to repeat the questions. <laughs> um, uh, it does have buildings within Travis County also. It does not have floodplain information as far as data elevations for all those buildings. So it's just floodplain information for city of Austin buildings. You can see buildings that are in the county, just Travis County and a little bit of Hayes and Williams and all the, but outside of that, no, it's not, doesn't include those areas. I will repeat that one. Um, so her question was, do you have an, uh, a website where you can find information about buildings outside of Travis County? And FEMA has a similar tool to Flood Pro. So I would look on the FEMA site, um, the MAP Service Center, MSC. I just Google it every time. I don't know what the email you know, address is. All right, other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, specific to Freeboard, so it's got to be the, f the finished floor has to be two feet above. Is yes, that right? That's correct. So from an insurance perspective, though, FEMA, uh, NFIP requires that the lowest adjacent grade be at or above the base flood elevation. So the reality of it is, is you can construct as long as you're two feet above, but there very well could still be an insurance requirement. Correct? That's right. That's right. So that's a great point. The insurance requirement is based upon the 100 year flood point elevation and the lag lowest adjacent grade. That is the lowest point at which ground touches the foundation. If the 100 year flood point is above the lag, flood insurance requirement is, kicks in. If the 100 year flood point is below the lag, the flood, uh, flood insurance requirement does not apply. So it's all based upon the comparison between the 100 year flood point and the lag. Great question, thank you. You stated that if the building or the proposed building is next to the floodplain it also has the free board requirement is there going to be some kind of measurement because currently a developer is thinking in the floodplain versus not in the floodplain but if you have a requirement of something that is next to the floodplain then the developer is going to want to know exactly what that distance is so i would i, I would not say that there's a distance requirement or or uh, we're not establishing a distance because it's based upon vertical distance, not horizontal. So in a very flat floodplain, you could be 100 feet away from a floodplain and still be within that two feet requirement. Within a very steep flood uh, area, you could be five feet from a floodplain and be 10 feet higher than the floodplain. So it just depends on the, on the topography itself. Um, I was gonna say something else, I lost my train of thought. I'll get back to it. Uh, hi, John Roshert. I work, do a lot of work in a subdivision that will now have about 40 properties move into floodplain area. Some of that seems to be infrastructure problems downstream from where the water flows at. What are the options for neighborhoods to influence how infrastructure is done and what kind of things would you say to that neighborhood association? Okay, so that's a great question. And that comes down to our department prioritizing where we're gonna do flood risk reduction projects. And all throughout town, we analyze where are these flood risks? Are the, where are the buildings that are flooded? Where are the low water crossings that are flooded? Why are they flooded? How often do they flood? And how does that compare to other parts of town? 
once we identify the highest risk flood areas, those are the projects that we do first. So our priority is based upon flood risk. Whatever the highest risk is, is the areas that we address first. So my, my recommendation would be to submit information, whether it be by 311, um, to say, hey, we've got uh, some flooding issues down here, whether it be debris in the creek or these culverts are not are being overtopped, whatever the case may be, to provide us with that information because that information is useful to us in our prioritization process. The other hard part of that is that there's never been any flooding in any of those houses in the past, so it's convincing them to yeah. get active. Is you're, you're exactly right. Realizing it's not your study, but what changed 1961 to today? Is this a, an analysis that the new study period brought more rain, or is it now including some projection of future rains based on historical data? What's causing the major change in the Atlas 14 result? Great question. So Atlas 14 is a rear view mirror look on rainfall data. It is not a projection at all into the future. And so what changed was that more than 50 years of data was added to the data set. And that data includes Hurricane Harvey, and all the other storms you've had around here, May 2015, June 2016, Halloween 2015, Halloween 2013, all those major storms are now part of that data set. And so you add 50 years worth of data to the rainfall studies, it's gonna change the numbers if you have significant storms within that data set. So the biggest change was that we've had huge rainfall events since the last time we did a study in 1961, or 98 for that matter. Hi. So my understanding is that after Hurricane Harvey, there was a huge money grab from insurance companies or from FEMA or someone to a lot of people on the flood plain, and they moved it on their insurance. So there's a lot of people that live on Lake Travis that are affected, and their flood plain changed. Houses that will never flood because they're above the dam are being affected by this, and it affects their resale value. Is there anything to protect these people in the future? I mean, I've read your redevelopment exceptions and all that, but I know you said, I think on one of your other uh, slides that they were gonna do something for Lake Travis and Lake Austin. But I mean, they're in a, I mean, I know, I understand that Lake Travis is like supposed to be coming up and down and that's its job. But there's a point where it can't go over the dam. These houses are not gonna flood, but yet they're being affected and they can't resell their property. So uh, what I would say is that the expansion of the existing ex exception we have is a way to allow those people to do something with their, their property and can be approved administratively, whereas now the only way they may be able to do things with this is with a city council variance. That, that, that's, the, that's the change that we're proposing. Other questions? Yeah, if you're currently have a property in the 25 year floodplain, like I'd listing that the driveway, the street, the house, over 50% of the house is in the 25 year floodplain. So if someone were to remodel it, or can they just have their, they can have their garage in the floodplain, correct? But currently you can't have a garage or store, it can be in the floodplain. Okay, so they can build the house above that two feet. I mean, with, with the current rules, if it's an encroachment in the 25 year floodplain and it does not meet the safe access rule, then that's something that more than likely would have to have a city council floodplain variance. If it does meet safe access, then that's administrative approval by staff. Thank you for a great presentation. I just wanted to make a couple of quick points if I might uh, and uh, a request of the audience. Uh, first, as one of our questions pointed out here, um, rainfall does not recognize political boundaries. So the, the towns around here that may not be doing this kind of work yet may well be affected. We've certainly seen some impacts on Brushy Creek and the San Gabriel River just recently. So this heavy rainfall is, is not just a localized thing, but the city of Austin's way out in front uh, getting this done. Um, secondly, one of the, an important part of this conversation is the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, ABOR, TAR, NAR have been lobbying 
for a multi-year reauthorization of NFIP for the last two or three years. All we've gotten is some temporary renewals. The latest one expires in November of this year. So there won't be flood insurance available potentially if we don't get another reauthorization, hopefully a long-term one this time. We have sent out calls for action over the last couple of years. And on a good event, we can get to one out of five Austin realtors responding to a call for action, asking for reauthorization of NFIP. So I wanted to ask everybody to do me a favor. Even if you've done this before, humor me. Get out your phone. Text TX Realtors to 30644. That will sign you up to receive those calls for action. It's a one click operation. You can do it from your phone, you can do it from anywhere. And uh, it will really send a huge message to Congress when this, this message, when this needs to be sent. Yeah. TX Realtors to 30644. Jenny reminds me that will also, this, at this point, enter you to win $1,000 for responding. <laughs> now the phones are coming out. <laughs> now that's great information. Um, and that, that is definitely what we want people interested in and about that process because it's significant for the, our, our residents. Um, we follow that legislation as it goes through the uh, Congress. Um, one comment about the um, other jurisdictions. We have been coordinating with Travis County on these changes, and they are right there with us as far as these changes occurring. Um, we have uh, uh, presented to their commissioner's court, and so they know that we're doing these changes, and they are with us as far as supporting us uh, through this process. Um, as you are probably aware, the Land Development Code, um, certain sections of it, I'll say Title 30, um, is the what we call a single office. Uh, for Travis County and the city of Austin, and our proposed changes are making changes to Title 30 in addition to the other sections of the code. So we are working with, uh, definitely working with Travis County and talking with other communities in Central Texas and along that whole I-10 corridor about how they are going to make changes or if they're going to make changes based upon this new understanding of flood risk. So we're talking with uh, lots of people to understand what they're doing and what we're hearing back is a lot of people are really interested in what we're doing. And so we're telling them what, what our plan is and what our actions are going to be in the future such that they may be able to take those same actions in their communities. Hi, um, I have two questions. Sorry, where'd you go? I'm over here. To your right, to your right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. For the homes that are bought out, what, uh, maybe you know what the, the sellers have to consider in making that decision because to me, like they obviously have a challenge of being able to buy something as well. So I've always been kind of curious at the negotiations around that. And uh, I've understood the Waller Creek work hasn't gone that well and I wondered if you could opine a little bit on that as well. Good, good questions. So in very general terms, our buyout process includes buying a person property and then also offering what we call relocation benefits. And that process allows somebody to find a new home and if it afford a new home with this buyout process. So both of those things work together. And we work with the applicant, uh, with the buyout person to buy, to sell and buy their new home close on the same day. So it's a process that we go through with them. Now, you don't have to uh, you don't have to request the relocation benefits immediately. I think there's a time frame on. I can't remember it's two years or something like that. So someone can move into a apartment for a, or rent for a while, and while they're finding or building a home, and then uh, request the real relocation benefits after that. Um, there are some good websites, so I just have to remember what they are. <laughs> um, so we have a, uh, several buyout, current buyout projects going on right now. Um, two of them are on Onion Creek, Upper Onion Creek, the golf course community. Um, lower Onion Creek is uh, right there, William Cannon, uh, William Cannon in uh, Pleasant Valley. And then we have some going on uh, Williamson Creek, um, kind of like uh, South 
no, Congress and Williams Creek. I don't know what the cross road is right there. Um, was that? Yeah, close to that. Yes, Sassing Ramble. Um, you had another question about Waller Creek. Um, and so, yes, the Waller Creek Tunnel um, has problems in the, in the past. But I I'm happy to say that it is now functioning, it will function as it was designed to function. And it is, uh, it's up and running. It's been accepting stormwater for years. Um, and it is, uh, it's in a position now that we are not, in the past, while the tunnel is being built, we were restricting development downstream of the, of the, of the tunnel such that the, because we weren't sure the flood point was gonna change or not. It's not gonna change if the, ton the tunnel is functional. So we are now releasing those site plans, assuming that the tunnel is going to function as designed. So that was a huge step for us um, to be able to tell people downstream of the, of the dam, of the, of the inlet, that develop your properties now. We are confident, confident that the flood risk downstream of that of, of the inlet is reduced significantly. Thank you for your question. Well, my question was very similar to that, but I'm curious if you could take it a little bit further. What is the criteria for the city to buy out a property? How many times does it have to flood or what kind of conditions? How do you all determine when you actually proceed with a buyout? So that kind of goes along with the prioritization question that I answered before. So if a particular area of town is either has flooded several times or is expected to flood, then we prioritize that area with all the other parts of town. And once we identify a project area, then we do an engineering study to identify what type of flood risk reduction project is going to be successful here. Is it buyouts? Is it uh, widening the channel? Is it building a huge retention pond? Is it a flood ball? And if that selection comes out to be the buyouts are the most effective way to reduce flood risk, then that is the project type that's identified for that project area. So it's project by project area. It's not, we don't have a, a, an overall uh, floodplain buyout program citywide yet. We are thinking about it. So her question was, uh, what happens to that piece of property after we buy it? So for the most part, those properties stay within watershed protection and it just becomes a green space. No development is allowed to ever happen on that property. I say most of the time because in the lower Onion Creek project area we're doing right now, we have a partnership with us and the Corps of Engineers and they're building a huge recreation area within the buyout area. So we bought out 423 homes with the Corps. There's a lot, there's about more than 800 down there, but just in this project area is 423 homes and we're building a huge recreation area. If you drive down there today, maybe after it's rained, um, it's, they're in construction right now, so it's going on right now. In that area, it'll be a recreation area. In most areas, though, it's just kept as green space. Um, when people look at the floodplain maps, they don't understand necessarily the difference between floodway and floodplain. Will there be any changes in those with this new analysis, and will there be any changes in the development within floodway? So, fortunately, within the city of Boston, you don't have to worry about a floodway, because we don't have them. There is a definition of a floodway in the land development code, but it's there just because FEMA makes us have it there. If you look at our flood insurance rate map, we don't have any floodways, whereas other communities do have floodways. So. The easy part of your answer is don't worry about what it is in the city of Boston. So what is a floodway? It, that is the channel area that is required to convey the water that is not going to increase the, the height of the water by a certain area. So it allows some encroachment on the floodplain and allows the floodplain to rise a certain amount set by FEMA, usually a foot. And if you encroach that whole area, the floodplain elevation is gonna go up a foot Within that floodway area, you can't build anything else because that's gonna rise more than a foot. So it's basically FEMA's way of saying, it's okay to develop on the outside as long as you don't, don't develop in the main channel portion of the area. In the city of Boston, we think it's a good idea to not allow development anywhere in the floodplain, not just the floodway itself. 
So again, no floodways for the city of Austin. Yes, Travis County has them. That's where you will see them as well as other counties and communities in the area. And then second question uh, to the gentleman's point, 50 years of data, new data, but there are communities who have existed through all of the recent floods that never flooded, not even a more than a half an inch on the streets. What's the recourse for those homeowners to try to fight the determination that their properties actually exist in a flood way or flood plain when they've actually never flooded over the prior 50 years? So we get that question a lot from residents that say, you're showing my house to be in a flood plain. I did, I've never flooded. I didn't flood uh, the two Halloween storms, the Memorial Day storm. And basically I say, thank, thank goodness you didn't. And you, you got lucky because if that rainfall, take for example, the uh, remember the Marble Falls rain bomb in 2007, 18 inches of rain in like six hours or something like that. If you move that storm just a few miles over Shoal Creek, we would have had a catastrophic flood. So our flooding within the community depends on where it rains, obviously. And our flooding, our rainstorms sometimes can be moved around. And so where it may have a huge flood, the other part of town may not even know it rained because, because of the way our weather goes. It, it, it just matters where you are geographically. So if you haven't flooded, then I'm glad to have not flooded. You've gotten lucky. But the engineering data that we, pro that we produce says that that risk of flooding does exist and it's shown on the map based upon the engineering data that we have, which is the best available data, shows that that property does have flood risk, even though it does had not flooded in the, in the past. We have, a we have a question from Facebook and then we'll get to you. Um, so um, David on Facebook asked, um, does this, how does this new um, mapping that y'all are doing impact the properties in the ETJ water, watershed? So properties in the ETJ that are also, um, you know, close to Austin. Um, and if so, um, if it does impact those properties, um, do those residents who are not in the city limits, but within the ETJ have similar rights to, I guess, buyouts, um, flood prevention methods? Um, they Will they be required with the, um, that two feet situation yeah yeah so with etj again i said we were working with travis county and where we're redefining the floodplains from a hundred year is now a 500 year that's going to be within the etj as well if this all passes our floodplain regulations free board safe access etc are just within the zoning jurisdiction not the etj at all that are, that area is covered by travis county and whatever their restrictions are, they enforce that section of the, of the code on that section of uh, ge uh, geographic area. So within the city of Boston, floodplain definitions are changing and the floodplain regulations are changing. Outside the city of Boston in the ETJ, floodplain definitions are changing, but the floodplain regulations do not apply in that area. So my question goes back to what I was saying and what he was saying about the whole, if you're not in that area, if you can't get the variance in the city so that you can rebuild on your property, your property becomes worthless almost because like I'm thinking, I'm still thinking of this person I know that's got acres on Lake Travis and they're now in a whole flood plain when they weren't before. If they get denied a variance, what are their chances on getting um, a request in a buyout? Again, the buyouts that we do now are project based. We don't have a general floodplain buyout program citywide yet. We have been thinking about it and it may come into play with something like that, but that's not something that we do right now. Other questions? Yes. I'm, I'd like to ask. Where'd, where'd the, you go? Sorry. I'm over here on the. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned before, but didn't give us the websites. You said you had several websites you could think of that might be helpful for us and I'm wondering if we can pick your brain on that. Yeah, the one that I can remember is austintexas.gov forward slash Onion Creek. And that's our Onion Creek floodplain project. It's going to give you the information for lower Onion Creek and upper Onion Creek. The Williamson Creek one is probably slash Williamson Creek. I don't know that for a fact, but if you go to our project page on the city, the watershed protection uh, uh, project page on the website, 
It's going to list all of our projects. Williams Creek will be in the list that you'll be able to click and find it. That's right. Travis County has done some buyouts as well, um, similar to where we do it. It's project area based um, in Onion Creek as well. So they're they're uh, they're doing them in, at the same time we are. So I'm presuming that some of the free board or the safe access or even the height higher uh, floor elevations could cause displacement that would adversely affect surrounding properties um, as far as the displacement. I'm wondering what engineering or hydrology work has to be done to help mitigate that and also what impacts that might have on pervious, impervious cover and how that can be addressed. Yeah, so one of the main tenets of our floodplain regulations is what we call no adverse impacts. You cannot develop a piece of property that causes flooding onto another piece of property. And that, in order to prove that, usually, is some sort of engineering study. And whether that's floodplain volume or floodplain levels, flood, uh, flood, uh, flood levels, you have to prove you're not increasing flood levels and you're not decreasing floodplain volume. And that is done through an engineering study submitted to staff, we then review it, and then if we approve it, it can go through the process, whether that process be uh, a city council variance, a administrative floodplain variance, or administratively with an exception. So we've got another question from Facebook. Um, Brittany is asking, how does this, these new standards, your proposed rules, um, impact lots in the city that were to be developed? So I'm interpreting that to mean those that already have a site plan approved, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, currently, if for any development that's getting approved, site plans, subdivisions, et cetera, um, we have communicated with DSD, Development Services Department, to provide a recommendation note to developers that says something along the lines of floodplains are changing. Please consider the 500 year floodplain when platting preliminary plan, platting, or the site plan, so that later on, when they come for building permits, they are not affected by the new floodplain regulations. So the way the process is set up now, you can get preliminary plan approved and a plat approved with the previous rule. After the rules are enacted, in port, enacted, I mean, um, and you come back for residential building permit, new rules will apply. That is what, that has been what we've done for new floodplain studies all the time. This is just a new floodplain study for the entire city of Boston all at once. So that is something that we have been thinking about and, and have been talking to DSD about, about how that process moves as far as the effective date of these new regulations and how it might apply to platted lots uh, that are to come back in for residential building permits after the new rules are uh, enforced. Oh, that's right, yeah. So we looked at the active subdivisions that are currently being reviewed right now, and I think there are 26 subdivisions. Um, of those 26 subdivisions, two lots, not two subdivisions, two lots were completely within the 500-year floodplain. And there were other lots that were impacted by the 500-year, but not so much that you couldn't build houses on them. So that was a pretty small percentage. We were a little surprised there was only two lots, but it was, that, that, was the rec that was the look at the current subdivisions that are, are, that are in review as of, mm, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago. Over to your right. Um, I have colleagues. I'd love to attend one of these sessions. It sounds like you've done them before. Do you have a schedule for future events? No. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, no, I'm not kidding, actually. We don't have a schedule. But as I said, we want to do more with your group and if that's more of these types of meetings, then we are definitely on board with that. What that schedule is like, I'm not sure. We'll work with Andre to get that down. Um, but the schedule for the next public hearings, as far as Alice 14 goes, um, again, leading up to the council meeting in February, um, probably going to start in mid-December or so, and then lots of public hearings in January, and then to council in February. So that's our schedule for Alice 14. As far as uh, future communication to you guys, um, to be determined, I would say. Thank you. Hi. 
John Rosher where'd, to get. Where'd you go? There you go. Sorry. Yep. Um, I want to make clear, you know, I understand the process, but you said that once Austin approves it, it goes to FEMA to change the maps. It doesn't happen the other way, does it? It does not. So FEMA, as you can, you can imagine, does not have the money to restudy floodplains. They look to the communities to, re, to, to map that new flood risk. And so if a community has the resources to complete that information, FEMA will accept it. So it's community restudies the floodplains, and then we give that information to FEMA. We haven't heard at all from FEMA that they have said, we're going to, on, our, on their own, restudy floodplains throughout the nation. They're relying on the communities to provide them with that information, not the other way around. So um, I do want to remind everyone that this is being streamed live on Facebook, and so then it also saves there for you to go back and look at it. Um, share with your friends and colleagues. Um, and there are people who um, have commented with um, different links that, that you mentioned so that those will be easily accessible if you didn't record it down or, or it was one of those things that you needed to Google. So um, as far as future sessions, just wanted to remind everyone of that. Um, and right. Jeffrey has a question. Some of us will walk away with all of this information and try to advise our clients. Some of us will have listened, some will have not. Um, given what happened to some of my friends in Houston, it, I think it's important for you, your organization, to say this, that this is only rainfall based. It is not based upon the unintended failure or intended release of waters through your control methods. That is, if a dam were to fail, none of your data accounts for that. Or if there was an intended release, for example, on Lake Travis to relieve substantial pressure upstream, the maps don't mean anything. Is that correct? The Colorado River floodplain is controlled by the lakes, all right? And LTRA does that, not the city of Austin. If Mainfield Dam fails, then yes, it's going to cause catastrophic flooding outside of what we know as the current 100-year flood floodplain. Um, other dams in the city of Boston, other than Walter Peak, um, we don't operate any dams. So, except for Longhorn, and that's not not a flood control reservoir. Um, so, LHRA does the work for the, for those dams, um, but that is true. The floodplain maps on the Colorado River assume that the dams are operating as they were designed to operate. It does not show what we call a dam break zone, what happens if the, if the dam fails catastrophically. It, 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 that's not on the flood, floodplain map. Yeah, go ahead. When you start to increase your flood control methods by in by creating neighborhood or citywide reservoirs. If those reservoirs were to fail, the same result would occur, I presume. True, yes. Now, one other thing that I failed to mention, um, remember that picture that I showed that had the Colorado River watershed in it, and there was not much impact to that Colorado River? So when we talk about uh, floodplain definition changes, the 100 year floodplain is going to be the current 500 year floodplain, that does not count for the Colorado River that floodplain is going to remain the same. So whatever is the 100 year now, would, will be the 100 year after, if, these recommend, if these code amendments are taken into, into place. So all that we are so recommending a floodplain definition change except for the Colorado River itself. Go ahead. Is there a place we can find this slide presentation? Yes. Andre, you wanna help us with that? So I gave Andre a PDF version of the presentation so that you guys can post it and distribute it as you see fit. Yeah, we'll send it out to everyone who's attended. We can also um, make it accessible through our website, too. Other questions? All right, I just want to thank you guys for braving the storm, if you will, to get here and putting your jackets on and joining us. Um, like I said, we want to do more with working with your group to, because you are the direct link to our residents and we do the best we can to get to them, but 
sometimes it take, takes multiple avenues to get to them. So thank you for being here. Uh, Matt and I will be here for a little longer if you have other questions. And uh, thank you very much. Have a great day. I just want to thank Kevin and Matt for such a great presentation. Um, we're grateful to have these guys as experts on our city staff. And thank you for sharing all this information with your clients. Appreciate it.